gospel reading is from Mark chapter 6, verses 1 to 13. He left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brothers of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor, except in their hometown, and among their own kin, and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and, cur and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. When he went about among the villages teaching, he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with, with oil many who were sick and cured them. This, this is the gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Amen. Thank you. Mike, you should be very proud and I know you are. So I want to start off my first sermon series with you by talking a little bit about what I believe a calling is. So if we think about our lives as a continuum, and that is a, if you think about a line where when you live each moment, it's hard to see significant changes, but if you were to step back and consider the whole, the beginning and the end are starkly different. Take a child, for example, you know, eager to get older for this reason or that. I can't tell you how many times my children have told me, when I get older, I'm going to fill in the blank, whatever. There's this future hope. But getting there is hard because the changes that we experience day to day, for the most part, are difficult to perceive. Now, I remember holding my boys when they were babies. You know, these little things that I, uh, they fit right here in my cupped hands, thinking, I can't wait to hear their voices, you know, or experience their personalities, learn their likes and dislikes. And you know that saying, the days are long, but the years are short. Yeah, that's, that's true, you know. <laughs> I remember my youngest having these uh, short, stubby legs. And he would get so frustrated, you know, uh, when he tried to run because he'd fall over. And I'd say, it's OK, son. Your, your legs are going to grow longer. Your balance is going to get stronger. And he'd be so impatient about it, you know, as the days passed. But then all of a sudden, this boy's riding scooters and tearing down the sidewalk at full speed on much longer legs. Now the oldest swore that he would never dunk his head under water at the pool, but now this boy's going to swim meets and going underwater. And going underwater. Now, if you could sort of zoom out at the continuum of your life, you might notice little inflection points. These are times where life took a turn and a major change altered the trajectory of what you thought was going to be a settled life. Those points demanded something of you. It forced you to make a decision because the status quo was becoming increasingly more difficult to accept or even bear. Now, some of you probably heard I had a car accident. I, I can't lean. This is, let me show you something. This is my leaning leg. I can't lean on that leg right now. 
If I lean on that leg, it hurts. I can't do that. I got to lean on the other one, right? So some of us are more willing to accept the pain of not changing than others. Look, I'm doing it again. You might even call them resilient, if not for the sadness of their situation. The change is not always a decision, of course, but let me tell you, it's a heck of a lot easier when it is. Now, a calling is an inflection point in a life where the Holy Spirit makes a demand of us, and we feel compelled to respond. As one called to Christian ministry, I can tell you that a call is more than a message because a message can be ignored. I mean, how many times have you ghosted somebody on your cell phone and you just weren't ready to respond, be it a text message or a phone call, and you were like, not right now, not right now. For me, the call came at 13. I was watching my mother preach at a church that started as English only and became bilingual English-Spanish. The little neighborhood of Westmont, found in Pomona, California, that's where I'm from, I'm from Los Angeles, was experiencing a change. You see, the white residents were aging and moving on as they downsized in retirement. Happens all the time. And the folks that were buying their former homes were Spanish speakers. Now, this was in the 90s. Reverend Anna Maria Dominguez Novella found herself amid an inflection point as a pastor. Do I ignore the changing demographics of the area and not stir the pot with my congregation? Or do I lead this church to go out and try something new? Maybe I don't have a good idea of what that is yet, but something's got to happen. And to her credit, my mom was big on honoring the traditions of the churches she was appointed to. I get that from her. As the neighborhood began to change and her church did not, she became increasingly stressed. There was no taste for change from the congregation, you see, save for a few members but she couldn't shake it. She couldn't shake the call. The call was louder and felt more real than anything anyone had to say about her cockamamie idea of going out into the neighborhood to knock on doors and share the gospel in Spanish with the new neighbors. Now, I still remember the day she came back from church and told me she's just going to do it. She didn't care if anyone was going to come with her. She's just going to do it. I don't know if it will do anything, but I have to do it, mijo. I got to do it. She was adamant. She knew she would face ire, but she couldn't shake the call. Now, God calls people, and frankly, it still amazes me why God does that. I mean, that's just asking for trouble. God knows how different this world is from what God intends it to be, which is why when God calls, the demand is often something that puts us at odds with someone else's desired continuum. And, you know, we work real hard to minimize undesired change. Some of us prefer stability, you know, structure, the feeling that, you know, hey, I got things under control. I'm big on all of that, by the way. Oh, I love it. I love creating systems that take something chaotic and turn it into something that makes sense. I can already foresee my future alongside my wife in retirement, me struggling desperately to just hang out in my comfortable chair, relaxing, her standing over me, demanding I do something with myself today or come with me to this class, or let's go away together, and all I want to do is just sit in my recliner in some air conditioning and forget about my problems. And that's not a surprise to her, by the way. I mean, she knows this about me. It's why I married her. You see, I create systems, even ones designed to keep me from succumbing to my flaws. 
Jesus. When we think of Jesus, we don't really think about his calling. We think about how he called other people. Most folks I've spoken with about this sort of, I don't know, they sort of accept Jesus' ministry as a foregone conclusion. But I think we cheat the gospel of its power when we fail to consider how Jesus was called. And exactly to what? Jesus lived in a time of great social upheaval as a member of a conquered people. Much like our time, his people were experiencing any number of divisions that scripture records quite clearly. Perhaps the most apparent to us was how Jews and Samaritans supposedly hated one another. You know, something we learned when we first heard the parable of the Good Samaritan, the Good Samaritan, which if there was ever a title that said everything, that would be the one. The southern region of Judea and the northern region of the Galilee, around the Galilean Sea, they were very different too, culturally speaking. The southerners were far more cosmopolitan than their rural cousins to the north. And this is to say nothing of the way the uh, influence of ancient Greece and the Roman state shaped not just a people, but quite literally the very landscape of the region. Has anyone here ever been to the Holy Land? Yeah. You, you, if you've been there, you've seen it. All the old ancient Greek and Roman ruins, right? They're everywhere. Some of them are quite large. And you know, there would be considerable judgment from one segment of the population on how you came down, on the value of these foreign influences. Now, we don't get to hear the words that God spoke to Jesus to initiate his ministry, but we can take a guess when we consider what happened at the synagogue that he frequented as a youth when he recites from the scroll of Isaiah, which says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So they tried to run him out of town for that. None of the groups mentioned in those words had much to do with the people that frequented that synagogue. To them, that was just another sermon. But for those listening, it had something bold to say. God is about to show favor to everyone society looks down upon. You know those people you look down your noses at every day? God is about to lift them up. And God has sent me to them. You probably even thought they'd earned their lot, that God doesn't favor them. I'm about to teach you just how wrong you are about them and about who you think God favors. Now, the ministry of Jesus was essentially a prophetic ministry. That is, he was called to serve as a prophet. And it's not hard to understand what a prophet is. It's very simple. A prophet is simply a proclaimer of the will of God. In a time when the people of God are acting in a way contrary to that holy will. Then as now, there are a lot of ideas about what was right and wrong, who was worth something and who wasn't. Our Lord was sent to face unclean spirits. Not just the strange and terrifying notions of demon possession but the unclean spirit found in each one of us, that sinful part of ourselves that pushes us away from God. Jesus was called and sent to Nazareth with a message that offended people. When he called his followers, he knew that they would face the same thing when they began their ministry. So he gave them what I think is solid advice. Bring God to these folks. 
Let them care for you. Because when they do it, they're revealing their love of God to you. They're not doing it for you. They're doing it for God. And so God is glorified through you. And they will begin to hope, you see. They'll have hope. But don't expect them all to receive you and this good news. And if they don't, don't take it personally. In fact, don't even let their dust cling to you. Just leave. God watches it all. There's something healing about facing unclean spirits for a community. And it's rough work but it's revealing. It reveals things that might never come to light otherwise. Things that get people talking and feeling. We try so hard to not feel, but that's not the way. We should feel with one another, even if we don't agree. And so they find their inflection points, forcing them to make a decision because the status quo becomes increasingly distasteful. This is the work we are called to, siblings in Christ. We're in the business of getting people to look around and ask, is this really okay? Is is this right? Can we do better? Sometimes, that's all a person needs to get them to take the next step in recovery or to become more accepting and loving to others, to find their compassion and seek a more meaning-filled life, to leave their selfishness behind and consider the other and how they're doing. It is my great honor and privilege to join you in this work. And folks, I can't wait to see where it takes us together To God be the glory. Amen.